we were um, essentially um, at this place when we stopped. Um, we, in fact, I was going to go over the Wikipedia thing, which we'll do at the end of the lecture today. So I was uh, trying, going to give the uh, proof of Schoenberg's theorem. Um, so essentially I had sort of introduced you to metric cones and then I had talked about how the universal uh, metric, which is the L infinity you can take any finite metric space and embed into L infinity. In fact, I forgot to mention that, um, you know, there's a simple embedding of L1 into L infinity just as a warm up. but I put the slide here so you can have a look at it. Um, so, so now what we're going to do is try to prove Schoenberg's theorem, which um, is relatively easy. It's not that hard to prove. Um, and uh, I just want to point out that th this is a good place to mention this reference. There is this uh, handbook of geometric constraint Prin systems principle, which is on the website that, uh, which is linked from the website that Christoph put on the chat. Um, so it's, uh, it's not inexpensive. So what I will try to do is extract uh, uh, chapters from it um, and, and put it maybe in the piazza um, so that people can um, access them. So um, the theorem uh, is actually in the, these uh, Schoenberg's theorem, et cetera. Can you see Schoenberg's theorem here? I can try to make it a little bit bigger. So, so Schoenberg's theorem, et cetera, are discussed in the very first chapter of this book. Um, the proof is not given, but I'll, here's the theorem. Uh, I also have linked uh, in that, um, in, in the site, uh, notes that uh, have been prepared by my graduate students when I lectured in my class uh, at various times. So we will actually use some of that uh, as well. Um, so I, I will put all the references there. So anyway, this is uh, Schoenberg's theorem, a real symmetric matrix with zero diagonal and positive entries um, is Euclidean distance matrix, if and only if it's negative semi-definite on the subspace of all vectors orthogonal to the zero ones vector. One thing I have to mention is that we keep forgetting to say that when we say at least in this often, uh, the people go back and forth, but often when the Euclidean distance matrix is mentioned, the distances are squared distances, right? So distance squared. Um, and uh, people sometimes use distances, sometimes squared distances, sometimes it doesn't matter for certain things, it doesn't matter. But uh, you know, you should be able to tell generally from the context, but if you're not just uh, ask, okay. So this is the theorem and uh, the theorem can be stated slightly differently and is stated often slightly differently. And so I just want to give you the other way in which is stated. This by the way is from Liberty's book. It's called, not book, I think it's like an article or something. It's open in the Wiley Open Library. It's called something like six gems of uh, distance geometry or something like that, right? So, um, uh, where was I here? So this for formulation is actually um, um, often used. So you can see that there's slight slight difference and let's like take this formulation. It basically says that a, symmet a real symmetric matrix is the Euclidean distance matrix of N points, which means it's the pairwise distances um, between point I and point J is given as Dij. Um, uh, and if and only if the matrix that is given in this way, so now the, the ij entry is given by just taking the d one i entry of this original matrix and d one j entry uh, squares uh, and subtract the dij squared entry. And that matrix, which is called G, is, happens to be positive semi-definite of rank R. Okay, so this is if and only if condition. 
And what the proof does is usually very simple. Uh, it just ma massages the Euclidean distance matrix into the form of the inner product matrix uh, of a set of points. So uh, that's all the proof is. So the inner product matrix is also called the gram matrix. So essentially you take two sets of point, I mean, a, a set of, if you're given a set of points, basically you can take, think of each point as a vector and then basically take the inner product of the point I with the point J and that will be the ij entry of this gram matrix. It's a well-known matrix. So basically, and uh, you can show very quickly that every gram matrix, uh, sorry, every PSD matrix, every positive semi-definite matrix in matrix with non-negative eigenvalues um, that's symmetric is also happens to be gram. And that proof is very simple and I, I have it here. So yeah, if you- can I ask a question before we move past that slide? Yeah. So if we go back to the slide with the two theorems. Yeah, this one. Yeah. Um, so in the top theorem. Yeah. Like let's say D equals two, yet yeah. the rank is let's say one. What does that mean if the rank is less than, strictly less than D plus one? Say it's a rank one matrix and D equals two. Uh, if it's a rank one matrix and D equals two just means that the points all lie on a line. Okay, and how, how do I see that? I haven't proved the theorem yet. Okay. 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 Um, so, is, yeah. will, will there be, will there be a, an interpretation for when the rank is strictly less than D plus one? Um, yes. So this, this basically just says that whichever dimension, think of it as the affine span of the set of points. Yeah. The dimension of the affine span of the set of points is exactly the rank of the matrix. Okay. 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 Or Thank plus you. one, whatever. Yep. That makes sense. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So, um, so, okay, so we're going to go to the proof and the, uh, before I go to the proof, I just wanted to say this minor thing, which is sort of assumed whenever this matrix, uh, this theorem is stated, is that every PSD matrix is automatically a gram matrix. A gram matrix means this inner product matrix. And so essentially the entire proof just simply must, as I said, massages the inner product matrix of the set of points into the distance matrix of that set of points. So let me quickly um, for, uh, go to that, uh, that sort of um, simple uh, known fact that uh, every PSD matrix is such a gram matrix uh, very quickly. So if you took um, matrix uh, to, to have eigenvalues mm, uh, along the diagonal and zero everywhere else, and take the matrix having the eigenvector corresponding to that particular eigenvalue as the jth column. So then basically you can uh, take the matrix that's given this way, uh, Y gamma Y transpose. And uh, so now because gamma is all positive or non-negative, if, 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 if it so turns out that the eigenvalues in the matrix are non-negative, the matrix is positive semi-definite, then this is a non-negative, uh, this lambda here is non-negative. So you can basically take the square root and this factors into Y square root of gamma, square root of gamma Y transpose. And now you can call Y times square root of gamma as X. And so that gives you your factorization of the original matrix whose, uh, you know, whose eigenvalues were non-negative that you started out with, the PSD matrix, uh, in, as the inner product matrix of two, um, of a set of points, x1 through x, uh, n. So that's basically just, and it also, by the way, this, this proof also tells you, if you're given a PSD matrix, how to get the corresponding set of points whose gram matrix the given PSD matrix is. So this actually gives you the realization. So X is the set of points um, whose inner product matrix is the given PSD gram matrix. 
uh, PSD matrix. Uh, inner product matrix and gram matrix are names of the same thing. Uh, they, they, they're used to say the same thing. So this is saying basically that any PSD matrix is a, happens to be a gram matrix. So with that in mind, we can go to the proof here um, and, and I'm going to just, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of uh, introducing you to some of the common things that I will be using as references. One of this, one of these is these notes that, um, as I said, my students um, wrote, uh, wrote up, you know, and, you know, with my with significant revisions from me <laughs> um, from previous lecturing. So essentially the proof is simple. Um, it's just, as I said, the idea of the proof that you're massaging a Euclidean distance matrix. Uh, I mean, you're, you're massaging a gram matrix into a Euclidean distance matrix. So we start, if Euclidean realization exists, which means that you have some set of points, P1 through Pn, we call them X1 through Xn before, but you have to get used to this um, changing of notation every once in a while. So, so P1 through Pn for some D. And then without loss of generality, we can assume initially, you know, D is less than or equal to N uh, because you can always embed in Euclidean space, you can always embed N points in N dimensions. Uh, so because the affine span of N points cannot be of dimension higher than N. So then take uh, the points, um, take P to be just this, and then the gram matrix, um, then its gram matrix would just be P transpose P. And now what we're going to do is, and here we're making the statement here, which I just proved a moment ago, the gram matrix is N by N matrix. And it is, uh, so one direction is easy, you know, um, the, if you take P transpose P, then it's positive semi-definite. And the converse direction I just proved a moment ago. So the gram matrix is an N by N matrix and exists uh, P exists, which means um, for a given matrix, it can be factored in this way as P transpose P if and only if gamma is positive semi-definite. One direction is easy, the other direction I just did. So the next, um, we will show the relationship between this uh, the Euclidean distance matrix and the gram matrix of this set of points. That's it, that the, the entire proof is just the, the relationship between setting up the relationship between the gram matrix and the, uh, and uh, sorry, this gram matrix and the Euclidean distance matrix. So you take the set of points and you assume that the centroid of the points is the origin, which you can always do. So uh, we are just gonna define this thing, uh, P transpose P, uh, you know, the, the, the inner products as um, uh, so, so we can, because we know that it's the centroid is the origin, we know that the sum of all the inner products basically um, is going to be zero. The sum over one of the, for any, so sum over i of gij is going to be zero and sum over j of gij is also going to be zero. gij is the inner product between the point i and the point j. So, uh, and now we, I'm, because we had the capital delta, the distances are small delta. So if starting out with delta ij denoted as pi minus pj squared, which is now the entries of the distance matrix, these are the entries of the gram matrix. gij is just the inner product between P, pi and pj. So basically you have the distance matrix can be written, I mean, sorry, the distance um, delta ij, which is the squared can simply expand it out to this which is in fact just GII plus GJJ minus two GIJ. And now you can just manipulate. So if you take the sum over I of these guys, uh, you, you know, you, you um, notice, we haven't yet come to this, this yet, uh, using this yet, but uh, you, you simply get this expression and then you take over the J's, you take over the I's, you take over the J's, you get the same expression, once over the I's and once over the J's. And then uh, now you can think of, and you can also uh, take the sum over I and J and you'll get this expression. <clears throat> and so now you can write the, uh, 
the gray mean entry, the gram matrix entry ij in terms of the uh, distance matrix entries. And this just turns out to be, if you wanted to write it out as main in matrix form, this just turns out to be uh, gamma, capital gamma, which has the entries gij, turns out to be this, which is identity matrix, all ones matrix. And um, uh, so then we basically get that uh, delta. So now delta, which we know is the gram matrix and which we know is positive semi-definite, uh, uh, is, is now uh, therefore tells us that uh, gamma is, um, well, uh, if you just wanted to prove uh, the, sh the second version of the theorem, we are already done. Uh, where was the slides? So for the second version of the theorem, we have all, all it meant is to say that um, all it wanted, all we needed to do is say that this matrix, which we just um, turns out to be the gram matrix, um, because it's gram is PSD of rank R. So the proof basically showed that the gram matrix was equal to this thing. Uh, if you wanted to show this thing, all you have to do is show that this item is negative semi-definite on this subspace provided G is positive semi-definite and that's all there is. So um, that essentially proves Schoenberg's theorem. Um, so the general um, structure is that, you know, you say that delta is, the Euclid is a Euclidean distance matrix, if and only if, uh, well, we haven't mentioned the rank yet, but we have just done the, the PSD part of it. Uh, so it's a, it has a Euclidean realization if and only if the corresponding um, the gram matrix uh, this gram matrix is symmetric PSD no the gamma that was produced in this way is symmetric PSD and this is exactly the same as saying that delta itself is negative semi-definite okay um, of rank B plus one I mean on that subspace which we mentioned in the uh, in the theorem. So that's essentially the um, proof of Schoenberg's theorem. As you can see, it's not difficult. And as I said, the main idea is to massage the uh, Gramian into the Euclidean distance matrix. Okay, so um, the, so if you go back to this slide, so we talked about having sort of a correspondence between two theorems, one of which is Schoenberg's theorem, which we just showed, um, where there's the negative semi-definiteness part, or in other words, the positive semi-definiteness of the gram, corresponding gram matrix, uh, which we wrote this in terms of. And um, the, uh, the corresponding thing here is a, statement of determinants of certain sub-matrices of this scaly Menga matrix, which is obtained from the distance matrix. Now, and, and the rank condition uh, was supposed to then become equivalent to setting some of these determinants to be actually equal to zero. This is non-negativity and this is uh, equality to zero. So in fact, we can forget this. Uh, the reason I didn't emphasize the rank when we were talking about the proof, the proof, the rank just follows the matrix as we go. So if you start out with the points in a certain dimension, um, the rank of the gram matrix is exactly the same as that. So if, if all the points lie on a certain uh, 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 subspace of a certain dimension, then the gram matrix will have exactly the same dimension uh, because it's simply the inner product matrix. And we also talked about uh, why, um, you know, you can see that from the proof that I gave as well. Number of non-negative, the number of uh, non-zero eigenvalues, sorry, just go here for a second. So in gamma, the num I mean, sorry, in, in this thing, uh, what is this thing? I don't know, the thing in the middle, lambda, lambda. So, uh, so uh, lambda uh, has some number of non-negative eigenvalues 
Um, and so Y and Y transpose will have basically essentially rank uh, rank equal to the number of non-negative eigenvalues, which is also the dimension of the set of points whose gramian it is. Okay, so um, so okay, so that's how the dimension comes in. But if you go here, I wanted to say that we can ignore this part, this whole rank part, and this altogether. And we actually get an e equivalence between the two statements. So essentially, this is the same as saying, you know, delta is an EDM if and only if it is negative semi-definite blah blah blah, or you know, the, the the expression that we got in terms of this, which is the gram matrix, is positive semi-definite. If and only if all of these determinants are non-negative. So you can forget the rank business for now and simply show this, uh, this equivalence. So let's see how we might um, do such a thing. So, um, so that would be in, in a way that would, so, that would show, um, that's another way of just showing the Cayley Manga, the first part of the Cayley Manga theorem. So, um, let me go to the whiteboard. Okay. Um, so one way to think, so, so because if something is an EDM, we just showed that, um, uh, hang on one sec, I have to be able to move this so that I don't, there we go. Okay, so we have a set of points whose realization, so we have delta is an EDM, is an EDM, and let's just say is DIJ, one less than or equal to I less than J less than or equal to N, is an EDM, and we have this uh, negative semi-definite. So, but we know that this is the same as saying I mean, by definition, that there are these points that exist P1 through Pn such that Pi minus Pj, as I said, we sometimes do square. So I'll just call this delta Ij for now. So, uh, so these guys, and I'm, I'm ignoring what dimension they're living in. They're living in some Euclidean space. And without loss, this is uh, you know, that, that dimension is less than or equal to n. So we can just say that. So, um, so if this is true, then this is true, then these, you know, the real, you know, those points exist. So if those points exist, so essentially that means that, um, you know, let's think of these points. Okay. So if I could, I can basically take any simplex. So I'm just going to call this simplex, whatever. Any simplex here. And it's, um, it's volume. So, so because this realization exists, so there are a set of points which are embedded with these distances. So these are the PIs. Okay. Okay. So these are the PIs. So the simplex, the volume of the simplex, which is now given by that Cayley Menger determinant, I'll just call it. Um, and so if this is a K simplex, then it's given by the CMK volume, the absolute value of this. Because these are points, this simplex volume is some volume and volumes are non-negative. Okay. Now you may ask me, so, so that gives you one direction. 
to go the other direction to say that if there is a set of points such that all of the simplex volumes are non-negative, then in fact, um, no, sorry, if I, if I have a matrix such that all of these, um, all of these uh, determinants are non-negative, then in fact, there exists such a set of points. So you can do that. You can actually find that realization by just, uh, by the non-negativity of these, by just starting out with three points, let's say, and you can, uh, you know, the, the corresponding Cayley Menger volume for three points, uh, the triangle area being non-negative just corresponds to the triangle inequality. And uh, so that means that the triangle for three points, the triangle can, you can find three points and place them with those corresponding distances in a triangle because that, um, that uh, determinant is non-negative, hence ten, that's the equivalent to saying the triangle inequality holds. And so you can place the uh, points. Um, then you can add another point and use the triangle inequality again, because that's non-negative. Then uh, now you know that, uh, so this is, I'm basically giving Cayley Menger's proof very quickly. So basically it, it, you know that again, for these three points, so maybe I use a slightly different color. So you've placed this with no problem. So let's call these guys P1, P2, P3, P4. And because of the triangle inequality between these three guys and this, this, so you know there is A, uh, so if this is the distance, the only problem is you're not quite sure that, um, so you know there's a triangle that you can place between P1, P3, and P2. Again, because that is a uh, not negative. And you know that, okay, this is the same distance. So you know there is um, another triangle here. The only problem is you don't quite know at this point whether if you, once you have placed these triangles, whether this point and this point will actually coincide with your P1 and P3. You know, there is such a triangle because the triangle inequality holds and you know, there is such a triangle, but you just don't know that these will coincide here. Um, now, remember that no, I mean, we're not restricting any dimension whatsoever. So you can place these points P1, you can increase the dimension by one and place these points wherever you want in the third dimension and, uh, and do this now. The reason why this is in fact, you, you, you know there exists such a simplex in three dimensions is because the CMK volume for the four points also is non-negative. So you know that there is such a simplex in three dimensions that will, uh, that you can achieve this as a simplex in three dimensions. So, um, and you proceed this. So this is basically by induction, you can prove that one, you can add basically one point at a time and you know that all the volumes, the necessary vol, you add dimension also one by, by increasing the dimension by one each time uh, and looking at all the volumes being non-negative means that there is such a realization of, um, of the set of points if all these simplex, simplex volumes are non-negative. That's a very rough sketch of the proof. Um, you can actually, um, if, you, if you go to the gems, uh, the six, um, let's see, this one here. Um, So if you go to this, uh, the gems and distance geometry, he actually has a complete axiomatic uh, proof of this, um, of um, 
where is it? Yeah, I think it's here. Yeah, so um, axiomatic proof, I mean, Menger did this with just the metric axioms and um, he has the proof of this, but essentially the, uh, I, in, I basically gave you, it, it's a pretty, it's not easy to read because it's done in an axiomatic way. But the idea is what I tried to give uh, just now. Um, why is it not sharing? Uh, for some reason, it doesn't want to show my whiteboard. What could be going on? Do you see my whiteboard? No. Yes, we. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> so, did you see? Uh, did you see the other thing I showed you a moment ago? No, just the whiteboard all the time. Oh, you've only been seeing the whiteboard throughout. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see, what did I try to do? So now you see this thing? Yes. Yes, okay, so this is from uh, six gems and distance geometry or whatever that Liberty um, um, Open Wiley uh, publication. And it's an, and he gives a complete uh, sort of axiomatic proof of what I just said with the angles and so on and so forth. And the idea is clear. Is, is the idea clear to you? What I just talked about with the, how you can show the converse direction? How you can use the non-negativity of each one of these uh, matrices, which correspond to these simplex volumes, and by induction build uh, a realization of these uh, Euclidean realization of these points. Is that clear? Any questions? Am I not hearing what people are saying or? Nobody's talking or can you hear me? I, I can hear you, Mira. Um, okay. I I have to say I'm not totally following the uh, connection between the Kaylee Menger uh, determinants and the um, reason why you can put these uh, points in position, but maybe I just need to think about that. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a, if you actually follow Menger's proof, it's kind of, um, it's not, it's not uh, easy to uh, read, although the basic idea is, a, idea is very, very simple. So, um, first of all, you need to, the first, the basic thing you need to know is that if uh, a determinant is non-negative, let's say CMK is non-negative, then um, then you can actually. So basically, all we're trying to show is that if this is non-negative, you can play, you can find such a simplex. Mm -hmm. And for three points, you can see that this. Um, this being non-negative essentially translates to just those three distances um, satisfying the triangle inequality, that's all. So it's basically a discriminant. Hmm. Okay, I'll think so, about that. Are the Ds, there's two Ds that you have. You have, this, you have yeah, the delta yeah. and the D, delta are those the is, same? They are the same, yeah. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Sorry, sorry about that. So this is, uh, it's, that came about because of the, let's see. So we started out with D, but then um, um, when, when I started ta using those notes, the notes were using Delta. And in a way, Delta is better because we're calling this matrix 
capital delta anyway that we've been doing throughout. Right. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. So um, this is basically the um, relationship between the two <clears throat> ways of thinking about uh, distance matrices. Um, Um, okay, so what we can do now, I mean, I can spend a little more time on it maybe uh, next time because I think we, we need to be very clear about this uh, for what we're gonna do next. So I can spend a little more time on this um, maybe next week. Um, <clears throat> So for now, okay. So how how about Schoenberg's proof? Well, I mean, the proof of Schoenberg's theorem was that okay? It's just manipulation, really. Yes. Okay. Um, so this one connection to Kaylee Manger, I can just do better next time. Okay, so um, before just, we go, just, uh, I just wanted to do one. Just a suggestion. Maybe yeah. we have to, like my colleague said, we have to think about it a bit. So go over the proof again and, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, we can mention it maybe next time if we need further explanation or if. Okay, sounds good. I'll ask you whether you want me to go over it uh, one more time. Um, so I guess what I will do now is um, move to the next topic, which is how many of these Kaylee Menga conditions? So, so um, let's go to the next page. So we have a bunch of Cayley Manga conditions, and we are uh, we can talk about the equalities for a second. Okay, so when we talk about the uh, simplex volume, the Cayley Manga conditions, the simplex volume being equal to zero. So, for example, if I say that uh, the the Cayley Manga condition for four points. Um, this is equal to zero, essentially means that you're saying that the volume of the simplex given by these four points is zero, which means that uh, they lie on an affine span. The, the affine span of the points is um, of dimension less than or equal to two, because if it had been three, then you wouldn't, the volume wouldn't be zero. So the affine span is less than or equal to two. Now, um, so basically what this is saying is that if you add a bunch of, uh, add these Cayley Menger conditions for K less than or equal to D. So if you, the simplicial volume being non-negative simply says that, um, you know, those points actually exist in real space. And this thing, uh, being equal to zero is actually putting a restriction on the dimension of their affine span. So <clears throat> this condition, essentially, if you put this condition, it restricts the uh, dimension of the realization of the set of points. So now my question is how many of these conditions are required. So another way to say it is if I assert a certain number of these Cayley Menger conditions, equalities, when I say conditions, I generally mean the equality and not the inequality. So, <clears throat> so if I assert a certain number of these, then th it does a real, by asserting um, a certain number of these, let's say k of, of k less than or equal to d, does that automatically imply a realization in d dimensions? So, or do I have to assert all of them? So you might remember 
the very first question that I asked about the number of these metric inequalities that we actually need to assert. This, these are not inequalities, these are equalities. But my question is, <clears throat> given that a certain uh, a subset of um, CM K equal to zero conditions hold, okay, <clears throat> for k less than or equal to d, um, is it sufficient, is this, uh, uh, given that they hold, are these sufficient? for um, existence of a realization in RD. So uh, realization existence in RD, okay. So if I, um, so, so that's the question. What do you think the answer to that is? Proper subset. So in general, the way that theorem is stated, um, you know, all of these conditions, every one of the submatrices of a certain size of k less than or equal to d has to be equal to zero for <clears throat> for this uh, realization to exist in a certain dimension. But my question now is: Is it sufficient to have a proper subset of them uh, be satisfied so that? we are guaranteed that just from that proper subset being satisfied the um, you can find an you can find a realization with just those now those uh, proper subset may only involve a subset of the distances in which case i'm simply asking whether you can assign distances to the other ones which are not involved in these proper subset uh, such that the realization is in rd so that's the question. What do you think? Yes, <clears throat> need to be rigid. Subset need to be rigid. I see. Uh huh. Okay. Good. So what you're saying is that if you um, the set of distances involved in the subset is a set of pairs, because every distance is between a pair, and you're saying that that collection of pairs forms a rigid graph. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, so that's. Um, so let me just go to another slide. So this is Faye, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I'm starting to recognize people's voices. That's good. Okay. So Faye is saying. Uh, I don't know why it's doing this, but okay. Faye is saying that if the pair, the set of pairs, distances, pairs, whatever, uh, involved, oh, I don't know. Involved is not a night word, uh, that occur, that occur. in the um, subset of Kaley Manger. Um, uh, conditions forms a rigid graph. How do you prove this? Uh, so in RD, I, I... Right. Uh, yeah, rigid graph in our. Uh, so we 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 had the Cayley Manga conditions. Let's see. The Cayley Manga conditions were d-dimensional ones. Yeah. Sorry, and do you mean a generically rigid? Like. You're not talking about, you haven't assigned No, this is not uh, generically rigid. You have a particular set of distances, right? 
yeah? Mm, yeah, okay, that's true, okay. That I'm given. Yeah. So you take that particular set of distances and you take the graph with th those distances, he says that's rigid. Is that is that a reasonable statement? Is am I interpreting your statement correctly, Faye? Yes. Okay. So I think what he's saying is that this set of distances forms you can say a graph together with distances on the edges, right, of the graph, the given set of distances that occur, and that thing is has a locally unique you know realization or something so this thing has locally unique realization okay why why do you think this is true maybe you can give an example as a start uh well, you can think about like four points with two triangles, right? Yeah. So the, the, the two triangles shares one uh, one edge. So so there might be two realizations, but 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 both of them are in are are two mm -hmm. instead of R three. So so the, the CM K three is is zero for for three for K equals three. Okay. But, but yeah. Okay, so let's start with something a little bit simpler. Let's build up to this, okay? Um, so let's consider the set of Cayley-Menger distance, uh, uh, Cayley-Menger conditions that correspond to the following, um, uh, the, the uh, a graph, which is what kind of familiar to you, which is also called uh, one, a zero extension. Right, so if you have, for example, so we're looking at Cayley Menger conditions of uh, less than or equal to D. So CMK, K less than or equal to D. And these are the ones that have been set to zero, and we have a subset of them, right? So, and I'm going to just uh, for the moment because I can't draw. So let's say D is um, uh, D is two. Okay. So, um, uh, we have to be a little careful here, whether it's D or D plus one. Okay, so if we have uh, the Cayley Menger condition for four points to be set to zero, then we know that that simplex volume has disappeared. So essentially, we know uh, is zero. So we basically know that these four points lie on a um, on a on a in R two, so the only thing that um, you know, so this distance is a very special distance. That's what it means in order for this to um, actually lie on the plane. So now, for the next point, essentially, uh, in order to uh, so basically, if you know that this uh, simplex, any one of these simplices, it really doesn't matter. So take three of these points and this one. Um, if that Cayley Menger condition is zero, then we know that this uh, point can also be placed in the same affine span of these four points. And similarly, you can take any one of these triangles and the next point. any one of these triangles, you could have started with the original triangle, it doesn't matter. And you can place this point here. And because we know that these guys all form in the same, fall in the same uh, two space, their affine span is of dimension two. And this simplex that I have just drawn is also of zero volume because I have asserted it. Then we, um, which means that this also falls in the affine span. So basically every point, as long as we keep um, 
that particular subset CMK, which corresponds to these um, for uh, these uh, uh, collections of uh, four points, um, as long as all of them uh, vanish, then essentially we know that this lies in uh, R2. So, so basically we, we, instead of having n choose four, if there are n points, then picking n choose four, there are n choose four of these k Lemenger um, <clears throat> uh, determinants for k less than or equal to two for D basically, remember we add these extra um, columns and stuff like that. D is the dimension. We are, it's easier to always think about, think about the dimension rather than the actual size of this matrix. So, <clears throat> so as long as we um, um, we have these, instead of these n choose four, we only have order n of these kaley menger conditions that we have asserted to be equal to zero, which still guarantees that this realization exists. Now, uh, by which we mean we know there exists a way to fill out the matrix uh, by all these other distances such that the resulting matrix is still of the appropriate rank um, or corresponds to a realization that lies in a certain dimension. So we only needed this many of them, even though there are so many n choose four of these conditions. <clears throat> and it also is talking about which distances we have specified. This kind of a, a graph is called a delateration graph delateration graph. And uh, it's what is, um, what would be a one, uh, sorry, zero extension in one dimension larger, one dimension higher than the dimension D that you're thinking of. For those of you who know what zero extensions are. What that just means is that, <clears throat> remember that, uh, also notice that um, I could have added a point um, here, for example, I could have added a point that isn't necessarily, um, you know, isn't necessarily uh, adjacent to three points that are connected by a triangle. I mean, it could be any three points here. I mean, I so happen to draw them in that way, but this could have been any three points, say, let's say that point and that point and that point, you know, um, there is a simplex there. We have already shown that all of these other points, uh, the, the, the previous set of n minus one points lie on a D space. That means that there is some distance here. And, you know, and so essentially there is a simplex here and that simplex volume uh, for that corresponding CMD, if we make the, if we make that equal to zero, then essentially that says that this is true. So in any case, you have only order of uh, n of these assertions that you need to make uh, in order to ensure that there is some extension by extra distances that still gives you a realization in two dimensions. So essentially we have a, uh, and these graphs are called delateration graphs and people may know them as zero extensions in one dimension higher. Okay. And they happen to be rigid in one dimension higher, right? So these are rigid, minimally rigid, minimally rigid. And we, uh, I think uh, Tony has already talked about this. So these are minimally rigid so if here it's D, D equals two, they're minimally rigid in uh, three dimensions. Okay. So, so that's one example. So now we see the, how graphs come into this. So that's one example of um, how you can uh, take a matrix where only some distances are given. And these distances correspond to the distances that occur in this subset of, uh, subset of uh, Cayley-Menger conditions that we talked about. 
and uh, then we can fill the rest, which is essentially comes from finding a realization. Once you find a realization, you get all the other distances. And because the whole realization lies in a certain dimension, that means that you have uh, filled it out in such a way that the rank does not increase. The rank is still the same. So whatever, I mean, the rank is, to, uh, whatever uh, kaley manga conditions, uh, the size of the kaley manga conditions subset that you had. So this, you can see, you can see hints of uh, where the matroid, um, matroid that corresponds to uh, having these distances somehow being dependent on these distances, uh, once these kaley manga conditions are asserted, you know, so um, that comes in as well. So I think we have crossed our, um, our time limit here. Uh, I'm just going to quickly go back to the slides for a second. And um, uh, just go back here to this slide. So we, you know, we started out with distance geometry. We had some results on metrics and norms. Um, we now have, you know, shown how graphs sort of come into everything um, and graphs and hint of matroids, although that was just a bare hint. We of course talked quite a bit on and off about the complexity, which is, you know, the number of checks we need to make in, it's not order n to the fourth, but say order n. Um, you know, right in the beginning, we had this um, lower bound on complexity where for metric cones, we actually needed to make order n cube checks. So some of that, and then the, now we will talk uh, next time about uh, how what we what we're doing here, which is the realization here um, of given a distance matrix to find a realization or a partial distance matrix to find a realization in a given dimension, um, also can be thought about as solving a system of polynomial equations because obviously the distances are polynomials and um, how that uh, leads to some questions. Um, whether a uh, common solution exists to a set of polynomials. Uh, that's saying that the one polynomial is in the ideal generated by them, if you're looking over the complexes and how you can change that, I mean, modify that question to a question about uh, whether there's a real solution. And that brings uh, the idea of Hilbert's null Stellensatz and positive and Stellensatz. So hopefully that's what we'll do next week so that we'll be able to at least uh, walk through um, all of these little bubbles that we have here um, uh, in, in the context of Euclidean distance matrices, uh, realizations, realization of Euclidean distance matrices. Okay, so before we go, I just very briefly, I think my uh, student, uh, William Sims, um, actually shared this with you um, this is the Wikipedia page, um, drafts, they are in Wikipedia drafts, uh, the colored pages are the ones that hopefully we will prepare in this class. These gray pages already exist and I mean they can of course be modified and improved and so on and so forth. So I'm hoping that as we proceed each of you will sort of uh, take on some of these pages, could be more than one person per page because I don't think we have as many pages as people who are in the class right now, at least, um, and uh, improve, improve it. So the drafts are already there. They were already worked on by some students from my previous class time that I gave the class. And uh, William will help you um, if you find it difficult, if you haven't accessed Wikipedia before, et cetera, you can just contact William and see whether it should be very, very easy. It's meant for you know crowd crowdsourcing, um, so it should be very easy for you to make changes, etc. But uh, 
So William is here, he's on the chat. So you can, uh, he's one of the participants and you can talk to him. Uh, I will open up the Piazza Forum today and hopefully everything will be a lot smoother uh, starting from next week. Okay, thank you.